The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report, a sunny Wednesday here in Southern California on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline in New York City. He's ready to talk the NFL draft for us. I can't believe they're having a draft when we're not going to have a season, or we might not have a season, or who the hell knows what's going to happen. But Mike Lombardi, what's happening? How much, Bill? How are you? You were down there doing stuff for NFL.com and NFL Network, and is it weird to be spending this much time on the draft when we don't have a season? Well, you know, I mean, I'm optimistic that we are going to have a season. It's just well, the weird part is the fact that uh, we're going to have the draft before free agency. So it's really going to challenge, I think, a lot of teams to decide on what direction they want to go in the draft and how they work the draft. Uh, ultimately, usually you have your team pretty much figured out. You sign free agents. You know which direction you want to go in the draft. Now the draft's wide open, and it's really going to take on a different life of its own. So you feel like teams are just going to take the best possible players, or are they going to draft for need more than ever this year? Well, I, I think they ha- the only way you can be successful in this draft is to take the best player available because you don't know what your needs are. You could lose a free agent that you thought you were going to resign because he's going to become a free agent eventually and you don't have the, the wherewithal to sign him or he wants to go somewhere else. So I think you have to just take the best player and then fill around that once you once we get the rules of engagement, when we get a collective bargaining agreement, or when, in fact, we go back to uh, 2010 rules once the lockout's over. So a team like Arizona, they're sitting at number five. They need a right. quarterback desperately. They don't want to go through another Derek Anderson disaster. Uh, the easy move would be to take Blaine Gabbert or Cam Newton if one of those guys fell to five. Or are they looking at this saying, let's just take the best possible player and we'll try to sign a quarterback as soon as we can sign free agents? I think that's the way Arizona wants to go. I think Arizona thinks, and maybe they have him in their back pocket, but I think they know they can probably get Mark Bolger. He wants to play in Arizona. He'll be a free agent. And their team really needs a veteran quarterback. I think they want to develop John Skelton as the potential guy, and I think they want a veteran to come in. And I think ultimately they can get a defensive player, Mark Bolger. Maybe their team can rally back, and they could be much better next year if they make that move. Removing needs completely, who is the best player in this draft? I think there's two two plus players. I think Patrick Peterson is one of the best players in the draft. He can play safety, corner. He's a versatile guy. Now, we took away his kick return ability because we've outlawed the kickoff coverage kickoff return in the NFL but so that really diminishes one of the areas he's sensational in and then I think Marcel Darius is one of the better players in this draft he can rush on all three downs he's an impact player he's explosive I think those two guys to me are the two top everybody says the receivers but receivers always worry me especially when you can't watch them get away from press coverage so if you had to pick two eight-time all pros that would be those would be the two picks that would be my two picks, yeah. I, I think, but I think this draft has some depth to it. It's got some legs to it, especially in the defensive line. I think a player like Cam Jordan is going to be a really good player. Von Miller can be a really good player in the right team and the right fit. Uh, he, if he goes to a 4-3 team, I don't think he'll have as much impact if he goes to a 34 team. What happened to Nick Fairley from Auburn? Why, is it, well, you know, why did he drop all the way down to the bottom of the top ten? Well, I, I don't think he's. I think he's out of the top ten now. I think his work habits certainly come into question. He's been a one-year player. Bill Walsh had the greatest line about one-year players. He always said, "Don't take the one-year player and look back, look forward. Take the one-year player and look back, and find out why he's really only been a good one-year player." And I think when you research Nick Fairley, you find that he's got some inconsistencies in his work habits. He plays very high. He's not a physical guy. When you look at his body. You've got to reconstruct his whole body again. He's got to get back in the weight room. There's a lot of work to be done when you can look at Cam Jordan and see a more ready player for the NFL. You can look at Marcel Darius, a, a guy who's better fit for the NFL. And then you can even look at Marvin Austin, who actually has got an NFL body. Mm. Yeah, but work ethic, you're in college. Like Your work ethic's probably going to get better the more mature you're getting, right? Unless you're just a bad guy. Well, I think when you research the defensive line, there's been 76 of them picked in the first round. 
in, in, in since 2002, and, and most of the mistakes have been made under the pretense that, hey, we're going to get this guy, turn him around. Jonathan Sullivan, yeah, he's lazy at Georgia, but we'll get him turned around once we draft him. Right. You know, and, and Winford Bryant, Winford Bryant, we'll get him going. Don't worry. We can make him into a pass rush. I think you have to be real careful with defensive linemen. They're a unique breed. Don't get me wrong, but I think you need to be real careful. When you, when you take one, you know you're going to get some work ethic out of them. But Nick Fairley wasn't lazy, though. I mean, that was a guy that I felt like was the best player on the field in, in a couple of the Auburn games I watched. I, I never felt like he was a guy that, oh, man, they need to light a fire under that guy. Well, yeah, you know, last year he wasn't. But I think when you look at his body and you look at his dedication to get himself healthy, he plays really high. And when you play high in the NFL, you're going to get hit and you're going to get hurt. And so he's got to lower his pad level down. I, I just think that he's a risky proposition. You talk to a lot of NFL teams, and the one player that scares at him scares them the most, besides Cam Newton, is, is Nick Fairley. It's the Auburn connection. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Cam Newton, I'm very surprised that he might be the number one pick of this draft. Did not see that coming. What changed over the last three months that propelled him into that spot, it looks like? I don't think Marty Bernie wanted to pick him in the first round either. I think what's happened is there's been a kind of – euphoric rise, and I think there's the scared of the unknown. If we don't take him, he turns out to be a good player. Uh-oh, what have we met? What have we missed? I think there was a period where they felt like Jimmy Clausen could be a good player, but then the reality set in, and they found out that Jimmy Clausen wasn't well liked by his teammates. Jimmy Clausen didn't play very well last year. Jimmy Clausen didn't have a real, real good future, so I think that carried into Cam Newton and what we can do with him and kind of the the – the whole enterprise around Cam Newton, the ability that you can run this offense, he's an explosive player, he can do some things, and I think it's just built and built. Well, I think it's now at the point where I think they want to make him the pick. Is it fair to say that they're doing this partly because it's the only way to really get those fans invested in that team again and interested? I, I think so. I think, you know, if they draft Blaine Gabbard, I'm not sure anybody's going to show up to their facility, but if they draft Cam Newton, I think there'll be a lot of attention on their team, and people will be talking about him in some fashion. And I do think there's something to that. But, look, Carolina has to get a quarterback. I mean, this is a team that's been quarterback list for so long that if they don't draft one, now whether they draft the wrong one is going to remain to be seen. This could set their franchise back five years if it turns out to be most of the people that are concerned about Newton's work habits, his character off the field, come out to be true. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of Jacksonville with Tebow last year, where, you know, it's small market, the way, who knows what the cap's going to end up being, all that stuff. And you, you may, I thought Jacksonville should have taken Tebow just because what else could they have done to make that team interesting? As it turns out, they were a little better than we thought. But with Carolina and, you know, what's happened to football there the last couple of years, I, I don't know if this is – an indefensible pick like it, it does make sense to some degree the question is if he stinks and he's out of the league in four years that's a disaster you don't think that's going to happen right no I, I think when you draft him i think you have to have a plan for him i think if, if you're if you're the carolina panthers and you say look we're going all in with cam newton then you got to have a plan on and off the field for him you got to have hey this is what we're going to do offensively this is how we're going to try to function as an offense we're going to run the spread we're going to we're going to build this thing around him and then he's going to be able to meet you halfway and you just can't assume he's going to meet you halfway. You have to have really people around him constantly to make sure that he's he's really diving into this whole whole thing about becoming a star quarterback. And you got to make sure you're monitoring him constantly to, to make sure your investment pays off. What are they worried about? That he's got a star complex? That he has an entourage that's dangerous? That he's immature? What is the biggest fear here? I think I'd say check, check, and check. You know, I mean, all three. Okay. You know, immaturity certainly plays a part here. I think the concern about who is actually in his ear, who's controlling him, who's really influencing him, how many people around him in his life, and then how important is being great. You know, one thing about you want to be an NFL quarterback, but how important is it to be great? You know, how important is it to be the best player? And I think that will worry you, especially when the way the rules are right now, we may have to give him $55 million of guaranteed money. And once you do that, has he been spoiled? Is money going to take him away from the, the game? What's your worst-case historical example of how his career will go? Well, I think he's better than Vince Young, so I, I, I think he'll, he can throw the ball better than Vince Young. I think historically he's better than Hakili Smith. I mean, this isn't a guy who just started one year because of circumstances. I think Vince, I, mean, I think Cam Newton, the player, can succeed in the NFL in, in, in an offense that suits him. I just don't know. I'm not sure if the character is going to get him to a championship level. I think he can certainly get to become good. I think ideally what you want with him is to become Steve McNair, somebody who started out very slowly, 
kind of built up as his career went along and kind of got comfortable around an offense and then became really great by the end of his career. But Steve McNair was, was like a leader and a work ethic guy, and you're Absolutely. worried that this guy has neither quality. That's what you're hoping you can develop them into. And I think if you can surround them with the right people, you, if you're drafting them, you're hoping you can change that element of his life. Well, I don't know if I trust Carolina to surround him with the right people. That's not exactly the most stable franchise. Um, no, and, and, and I mean, there's no leadership there. That's the other problem is now he comes in, he's the leader of your team. You better make sure you've got somewhere where you can control what he's up to and he's not, and he understands what it's like to work hard. He has to be around a guy that can prepare him to be a good pro. Blaine Gabbert just seems like all the draft experts seem pretty committed to him being better than Cam Newton. Better prospect, better gamble, everything. What is your historical comparison for him? Who is he if his career turns out well? You know, I, I think he'd be a lot like Matt Ryan. I think he's got a lot of Matt Ryan in him. He's a tough kid. He's smart. He's more athletic than Matt Ryan. I think if the offense suits him better, I think if he, if he fits around that offense, it'll be, uh, you know, that's tailored to him. I think the thing you have to do with quarterbacks in the NFL is you have to be able to design the offense around their strengths and their weaknesses. There's only three or four guys, maybe five, that can really just run an offense and just go out there and start calling plays. Yeah. Everybody else, you've got to tailor that offense specifically to what the guy can do. And I think well, what's happening with Blaine Gabbard is, is we're just projecting him where he is today. And I think you've got to put some coaching into him and you've got to be a visionary and say, hey, he's got this skills, here's what we can move him along to, and this is what we can do. It's funny. Everybody talks about, about you know, uh, Mark Sanchez and this and that. But one thing the Jets have been able to do is – build a structure around him that has been able, where he's been successful within that structure. He's had ups and downs, but there's an area where if he plays well, they can win. Well, here's something I don't like. I don't like his name. I don't see <laughs> Blaine Gabbert being a, being a nine-time All-Pro. It's a, it sounds like it's like a Darko Milicic kind of name. It just feels like Busty to me. Yeah, Is that uh, fair? I, I, uh, yeah, you know, I think names have I think names and numbers are important too. I look at a guy's jersey number; it bothers me. Like, I don't like Javid Best in forty four. Like, I think he's going to be a great player, but I think he'd be a lot better if he changed to twenty three. Right. You know, right. I, I, I think there's a number element that you have to do. Every time I watch Javid Best, I want to call the Lions up and say, "Can you change his number, please?" But, but you know, I, I, and the other guy, I think the, the sleeper in this draft, the guy who's going to be the, the Marcus Cousins of this draft, is going to be uh, Ryan Mal. He's going, oh. to turn out re- he's going to turn out really good for somebody, or it's going to be a disaster. Yeah, we know what Cousins did. The Sixers passed him up, and certainly maybe we'll live to regret that one. But Mallet's got unbelievable ability, and I, and I just want people to – and you're a New England guy. You're an expert on the Patriots. Mallet is a better – and I was told this by somebody in the league – is a better Drew Bledsoe. Now, nobody wants to admit that because everybody has Bledsoe up on this pedestal. But Mallet throws the ball more accurately. He's got more toughness than Bledsoe had. He's a better leader than Bledsoe had. And he can do everything Bledsoe can do. And he fell out of the first round because teams are basically horrified by him. I think that the perceptions are running into the ground. I think if you'd spend any time studying them, and David Hyde from the Florida, from the uh, Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel did a tremendous job of, of writing an expose on Ryan Mallet. That was based on fact not based on a lot of fiction. I think it was really well done. And if you do your research on Mallet, you'll find out he's a son of a coach, very dedicated to football, loves football, smart about football, and has leadership qualities. Is he immature? Has he done some things off the field that he probably regrets? Yeah, I'm sure probably most of all our children have done that yeah. at one time in our life. But I think he's got enough maturity in them to want to be a great pro. And when I want him to be a great pro, he'll do the things he has to do to be a player. So you're saying if he's sitting there at number 28, and my New England Patriots are on the clock, and they have a chance to get this guy who could who could really be the best value of the draft if he pans out and put him in the Belichick system and go, have him send him to Tom Brady school. That's a home run pick potentially. It could be. I mean, if he, you if he goes up to New England and he watches Tom Brady work and he starts following Tom Brady, that would be the ideal situation for Ryan Mallett would be to watch how somebody does it and then just monitor him. I mean, Ryan Mallett's not a guy like Ryan Leaf who just doesn't like football. This kid has a lot of pride about himself, and he loves football. So I don't see that. I, I see that being a great pick. I think if he gets down to 28 or even the top of the second round, I think he's one of those guys like Boomer or Science who's going to go later than he should have gone and is going to end up having a better pro career. What about Trent Dilfer's test of the five quarterbacks who are getting in the car and they all throw the keys to Sanchez? Does Ryan Mallett have that quality? I think so. I think he saw it at the combine. I think he saw it when, when he was out there with his group. The people in his group followed him. 
he has natural leadership ability, and he understands what it takes to be a winner. He's not looking to skirt the blame from anything. He'll take responsibility for his actions, which ultimately builds leadership within the core of his players. So uh, I do see him as the guy taking the keys. I think that's one of his areas of strength. It's not a weakness. If Andy Dalton didn't have red hair, is he a top 15 pick? <laughs> I mean, Sonny Jordison had red hair, too. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand the hair color. I'm, I'm not sure I get that one. But, look, I mean, Andy Dalton is... A lot of things. Uh, you know, it's funny. I think I watched Brian Hoare, and I, I, Brian Hoare from the, the Patriots. I think Brian Hoare is a better player than uh, than Andy Dalton. I mean, he throws the ball with more velocity. He's got more movement, and he's led Michigan State to teams, and he's played well for the Patriots. So it's interesting how diverse opinions of quarterbacks to be. Andy Dalton is the fresh new guy. Yeah. You know, Hoyer, Hoyer's up there, and, he, and he's not as fresh. He's not as new. He's playing back up to Tom Brady. Nobody knows. You know, to me, there's, they're very similar players. Who is the quarterback who all he ever did, and who is the quarterback in this draft who all he's ever done anywhere he's been is win? Uh, that would be Dalton. And, and, and I'll tell you the other guy that would be, that would be, that would be Brian Mallett. He's only one, he's one in high school. You go back and look at his high school records, he was successful there. He goes to Michigan. The only reason he doesn't stay at Michigan is because Rich Rodriguez comes in. He would have gone to whatever school his quarterback coach would have went to, but he decided – that the coach didn't go anywhere, so he went to Bobby Petrino because he felt like he could win at Arkansas. Mm. So I, that's why I like Mal because I think he knows how to win. I think Andy Dalton knows how to win. Blaine Gabbert's been successful, and you know, and Cam Cam Newton has been to a degree at junior college and at the one year at Auburn. How about uh, Pouncey? His brother is in the draft, and people have him going in like the twelve to twenty range. There's no chance Pittsburgh can get him, too, and team them together. I like when brothers play together. That's not going to happen. No, right? I don't think that'll happen. They, they could need to play together because Mike Pouncey, unlike Marquise Pouncey, can't snap the ball and shotgun. He struggles a little bit. It's going to take some time to work him out in that area. So it would be good. If, he's going to go somewhere and play guard for some team because he, he needs to figure out how to work that long snap. I'd like to see them play together. Shotgun. I like when brothers play together. <laughs> I liked when the young buds played together once upon a time. It was just good. So the Pats... 17, 28, and I can't remember the other pick. Uh, 30, 33. 33. Basically three first rounders. And I, and every Patriot fan knows not to get their hopes up with this, that we'll end up trading back or we'll trade for a pick next year or whatever. There's no chance whatsoever that they just take the three best guys they can possibly take at those three spots, right? I would say probably highly unlikely, yes. Yeah. So I think that the, the draft's going to take on a different life, starting with the Cowboys at, at nine. If Now, if the Cardinals can make a trade at five, that's maybe where the draft takes on a different life. But once the Cowboys, if they trade the pick, and then I think New England being in that cluster at 17, the draft will take on a different shape in the middle of the first round. And then at the end of the first round, I think their 28th pick is going to be the pick they're going to really be able to come into play because it will have the most value because teams will want to come in there and get the quarterback that they couldn't have gotten in the top of the second. So well, I think that pick, that pick will really be the key pick. Well, and also with 33 because they only do the first round, right? So they'll have a right. whole day to shop 33 before the second round starts. Right, but they also know that they trade 28. So they trade 28 back to 37. Yeah. Okay. They, they, you know, now all of a sudden they're really not. They're only losing five picks. They're not losing. They're not losing nine picks because they got the thirty third pick oh, yeah. right there. Yeah. So it kind of they, they have a floor built right into the, what they can do. So it really gives them a lot more flexibility. They could trade twenty eight and go all the way back to forty, and know that they have thirty three sitting there. So they're only ever going to lose five players. And how how much of a priority is offensive line for the Pats? I think it's a significant priority. I think offensive and defensive line are. I think the receiver's going to have to come with a veteran player, especially to know the offense that they run there. It's not easy to come into the Patriot offense and just snap it up quickly. So I think it's going to have to be a veteran receiver. So I, I see offensive and defensive linemen coming deeply into play here. Right, well, I have my hopes set on Mark Ingram. Should I just let myself gently down right now? That I mean, first of all, he's a saving guy. Saving Belichick, yeah. you know that connection. If Saban thinks Ingram's going to be fantastic... He would tell Belichick that. The Patriots have needed a running back since Corey Dillon died. I mean, why isn't that the pick? Um, well, I, I think because running backs, especially ones who aren't special, you can't pay that commodity for. I, I think you could pick Daniel Thomas from Kansas State at 33 or if you traded down to 36, and you might end up with a better running back. I mean, running backs today have to be really sensational to go in the first round. And Mark Ingram's only carried the ball 14 times a game. 
in his career. He's not the best back at, at, at Alabama. I mean, the backup running back is the best back at Alabama. And then you add the fact that he's got some concerns about his knee. He's got, he's got, he's got not a long-term career in terms. He's a great kid. He's not a great pass protector. There's some question marks. I don't know. I think the Patriots don't go in that running back. I think the question you have to ask is how much better is he than Talabadi Kane? Now, the fans will say, oh, he's really a lot better than Tullab, than, uh, than, than Green to Jarvis Ellis. But yeah, the but, reality of it yeah. is, I don't think there's a significant upgrade over that. I think they, I think Daniel Thomas would be a significant upgrade over that. Right, and really, the thing they need more than anything is the pass rushing offensive line, uh, pass rushing uh, outside linebacker, and right. so, the be- the best guy for that they're not going to get Von Miller because he's going to go in the top five. Right, the running back isn't why they lost last year. Right, so running back, you know, and so knowing Belichick, he's going to put the position to put himself. If he can get more pass protection, that certainly can help him. If he can get a better a better rush off the edge, that'll certainly help him. If he can get a better linebacker that can make plays, that'll help him. But I think he'll focus on what ultimately is the reason why he couldn't get to the next round of the playoffs. Do you think he's going to overreact to that Jets loss, or is it was the Jets loss? It was what it was. It was just one of those days where nothing went right. I think it was one of those days. I think the, the reaction to that jet loss is going to be, we've got to get a receiver that can play on the outside. I think that's the reaction to it. Okay. And I think that's what that's what he'll do. And, you know, he's pretty good at, at being even keel and keeping things in perspective. I'm looking at this top, I don't know, top eight until you get to Dallas, because Dallas clearly has enough talent that if they hit that pick and added, you know, and spend whatever, they, you know, they, they could thrust themselves right back in. But you look at the top seven. San Francisco to me is the only team that if you know if let's say they add Patrick Peterson the cornerback which is what a lot of people have going him and you look at the talent they have and you look at Singletary who clearly just should not have been a head coach I feel like that team underachieved couldn't that team could potentially be a Super Bowl contender with the right pick there and the right free agents right no question and I think you add the fact that the, you know St Louis is going to be to me St Louis with McDaniels and Bradford as a combination is going to be a very deadly, so they're going to have to beat them. But when you look at the, the whole landscape of the West, I think San Francisco, with the right couple moves this offseason and with the draft, they can easily vault themselves to a position of dominating the NFC West, assuming they can handle the Rams, which they did. They were much more physical than the Rams last year. So assuming they can do that, I think they can clearly vault themselves in the ideal position. Is there another team, like would you say maybe the Cleveland Browns? No, I think Cleveland, you know, even though Mike Holmgren fired Mangini thinking he should have been better, I think the, the Browns overachieved last year. I don't think the yeah. talent level was what Mike thought it was and for the reasons he gave for firing Eric Mangini. So, you know, I, I don't see that team. I think Washington's got a lot of holes to fill. You know, Dallas can break down very quickly, Bill. I mean, if they lose any of those offensive linemen, they don't have any depth and they're all over 30 years old except for Doug Free. And I think they're going to have to make some strategic moves in the draft. But other than that, really, those teams picking in their top ten deserve to pick there because they're not very good. How about the Minnesota Vikings at 12? I think Minnesota's a team that hasn't hit rock bottom yet. I think they're on the decline. Yeah. I think they think it's a quarterback that's going to turn them around when they have some other issues. They don't have a corner. Their defense is one of the worst tackling defenses in the National Football League. Their linebackers universally are slow. And their defensive line, the strength of their team is getting older. Now you go to their offensive line. You know, other than Hutchinson, they need a left tackle. Phil Lothholt, the right tackle, really struggles to cut off anything on the backside. He struggles with pass protection. Add the fact they don't have a quarterback and they might not have Sidney Rice. I think this is a team under repair, not a team under re- uh, re- reestablishing themselves for the Super Bowl. And you don't feel like if Buffalo got Von Miller and he became a star immediately, that's not a team that could do any damage, right? No, because Buffalo's problems in the offensive line will keep creeping up on them. Yeah. There's not enough depth in Buffalo. Buffalo might be able to win a game, but they can't. They can't win enough in 16 games, you know. And the depth is going to always hurt them. They're a long way from getting it fixed. And Buffalo is the kind of team that that you know can get hot and get close, but can't finish games. Dallas at number nine. It always seems like they're going to do the right thing on paper and just like I'm looking at this one mock draft hasn't taken Tyron Smith from uh, USC, the offensive tackle. But yet they always have to make a splash and do something interesting and try to get people talking or whatever. What do you see them doing with that ninth pick? Well, I, I think they like the idea of being able to move around. I think it's Jerry's calling. I think he likes to be able to, to be a little Belichick in and try to move around and play the value. I think he's got four or five guys he likes, and if he thinks he can move down and pick up an extra pick, he will. I think Tyron Smith is one of the guys he does like. 
the young offensive linemen that would give them some versatility. But I also think they can move down and think they can get a defensive lineman, whether it's J.J. Watt or Cam Jordan or one of those guys. So I think he'll try to manipulate. He's out selling the pick right now, telling everybody he thinks he's got some action on it. I would, that's why I said I think the draft starts right there at 9. I think that's where things will start to happen. Favorite two players outside of the top 15? Uh, I like – well, that's a great question. I like Daniel Thomas. I think he's really a good running back. I think he's got – Steven Jackson-like ability to run the football. I like Jarrell Jennigan, who's a wide receiver from Troy State as a slot receiver. I think he can be really an effective player. And one of my favorite linemen is a kid named James Carpenter, who I happen to think is the second-best left tackle in the draft. I think he'll end up going in the first round tomorrow, but uh, late in the first round. I think he's got enough talent to be a starter. He's a guy who started at Alabama, and he's been able to play left tackle and, and do some incredible things. So I think Uh-oh. He's a player. Alabama. Yeah, Nick Saban, Bill player. Belichick. <laughs> There's a name for you. <laughs> well, the, the Matt Light, it's time to send him out to pasture anyway, so well, we need well, a left you got, tackle. you got Sebastian Ballmer there, and so if you drafted a guy, you can always put him. You've got, and you've got Nick Kayser there to play right tackle if he's back is healthy. So you got some positional flexibility. Yeah. Oh, now I'm excited. What was that guy's name again? It was... Uh, uh, Danny oh, Carpenter? Carpenter? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be excited about him. Uh, Green Bay Packers, what do you... Do you trade up, down, anything, or are they just riding uh, their laurels? I think, Green, I think Green Bay will probably try to, you know, because they know what they know. Uh, San Fran, they know New England will sell the thirty-third pick. So I think Green Bay's kind of in the right frame of mind. Will sell the thirty-second. I don't think they'll pick at thirty-two. I think they'll move down and try to collect a few more picks. This is the kind of draft where I think Ted Thompson can utilize the skills as an as an evaluator and get more depth for his team. Something I think he needs. There's nothing there that could really send him over the edge and say, oh, boy, I've got to have that. Uh, I don't see him picking a running back that early. I think he understands value of running backs. Uh, I think he could probably now, Brooks Reed, an outside linebacker, is somebody I keep hearing that they like to pick, somebody who's very similar to Clay Matthews in his, in his style of play and his competitiveness. So I, I could see that. The Jets have talked about drafting him, too. So if he's gone before his pick, I could see him trading back. All right. And uh, how are you feeling about the Sixers after a yeah, noble well, effort, stave off the sweep? You know, I, I like the fact that they gave great effort. I, I like I like everything about the team. I just hope they don't think they're good. I just hope they take this and, and feel like it's a foundation and we got to build on it. And it's proven that if they could just get a great player around some of these role players they have, they could be a better team. Donovan McNabb. Is that too, is that too much to ask? Yeah, I was, listen. Yeah, I think it was a very encouraging year one of the Doug Collins era. And I was encouraged by Evan Turner's performance the other night, so uh, that made me feel better. I like him. He's up to stuff. I'm not giving up on Evan Turner. Me either. Uh, I think McNabb, he should take a Cousins, but, you know, yeah. They, they were scared of Cousins like a lot of people were scared of Mallet. You know, it depends on your homework. Uh, you know, going back to Donovan McNabb, a lot of people in the league seem to think he's already going to become a Minnesota Vikings. And I think if that's the case, then I think Washington has to take a quarterback at 10. That's another intriguing team. Washington's been sneaky quiet. They haven't said a word all off season, so it's interesting to see what they're up to. Wow, you think McNabb on the Vikings? Yeah, I think it's. I think that's everybody in the league. The people I've talked to in the league think McNabb's going to be a Viking. Wow, I don't know that if I like sense. that. I mean, the, the Vikings. The Vikings are a team that loves to. Uh, you know, they think that they, they're in that mindset where they think they can make that one more run. Mm-hmm. You know, they're misevaluating their own team. They haven't really been honest with themselves. I think they really need to study the tape last year and find out. Yes, Childers was a disaster, but B, there were some other players' problems. Yeah. Well, you, we've learned over the years uh, never to trust a team that fired a bad coach because if they replace them with a competent coach and a decent key, you just never know. Right. So let's say let's say Frazier's good. Let's say McNabb has one more year left. I don't think he does, but it's not far-fetched. But I agree with you. It seems like uh, if they think he's going to be the magic elixir, they obviously didn't watch him last year. That's right. So, you know, and then everything becomes the blame of somebody else instead of really being honest with yourself. So what happens after this draft to you? Do you just like you just wander the streets like Ron Burgundy no. with a beard and <laughs> wonder what, when football's going to happen? Yeah, I, I got no pictures to watch. It'll be yeah. devastating. I, I will probably I'm going to do a arena league game, and then I'm probably just going to chill out and just study some and hopefully get the season to go and watch a lot of pro tape. All right. Well, hopefully Ryan Mallett will be a Patriot, and you'll be able to take him under your wing, introduce him to your sons who are very well behaved. Your sons can take him out and keep him out of trouble, and it'll be fantastic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it'll be great. I think it's going to be a fun draft. I really do, because there's a lot of people that are that are really uh, interesting players, and it'll be fascinating to see how it all transpires. All right, Mike Lombardi, a pleasure. As always, we will talk to you. Uh, hopefully there will be a season this year, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon. All right, Bill. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.
All right, let's stay in New York City for the first time ever on the BS Report. ESPN's Adam Schefter, what's happening? Bill, i got to tell you, it is an honor to be on the BS Report. I've obviously been tweeted by you. Yeah. We know that famous story, which we could share with everybody, but I've never actually had the pleasure and the honor of being on the BS Report, and what better time than the day before the draft? Yeah, and now I have your email and 19 of your cell phone numbers because you said next time I have some sort of scoop on the level of Moss getting traded to Minnesota. <laughs> hey, that was outstanding. i got to tell you, that night I was at uh, orientation for my daughter's nursery school. Yeah. And I get, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a Tuesday night, if I remember correctly. You don't forget these things. Am I right? It was a Tuesday night? Yeah, it was somewhere around. I think it was. Yeah. yeah, it was a Tuesday night, and I'm thinking, okay, it's in season, usually very quiet, routine, nothing's going to happen. I'm going to be able to go to the school, and, you know, we're sitting here in this old big Catholic church, and all of a sudden my Blackberry starts going nuts, nuts, <laughs> with people talking about the fact that Randy Moss can be traded to New England. I'm saying, oh, my God, I can... For one night, it would just be nice to be able to just focus in on something other than that, but that was a huge one. You were on to it first. I tip my cap to you. I salute you. Please don't be taking my job now, Bill. I would really <laughs> be angry about that. I think that was a one-time thing. And what's funny is you look back, and it's like he couldn't have had a less meaningful season. You know I, you know I think you know, what's, you know what's amazing about it? I was thinking about this, and we're going to talk about this on the ESPN broadcast on Friday night. The Minnesota Vikings, run by Ziggy Wilf, the owner, Wigan traded a third-round pick for a wide receiver that they had for a few weeks that did nothing. And then, to chase that, to chase that mistake, Ziggy Wolf then went after Vincent Jackson, which, a, a commendable move, smart, smart by their personnel people. But what they do decide to go do is they offer Vincent Jackson a two-year contract, two years, $18 million, $8 million in 2010, $10 million in 2011, and when Judge Nelson, and I hate to bring up the legal aspect of this all, writes her 89-page decision the other day ruling in favor of the players to lift the lockout, one of the primary cases that she cites as evidence for her ruling is the fact that the Minnesota Vikings and Ziggy Wilf were willing to pay Vincent Jackson $18 million over two seasons while the San Diego Chargers kept him on their roster and paid him $682,000. And that, Judge Nelson ruled, was irreparable harm. So Ziggy Wolf goes and trades a third-round receiver for Randy Moss and then goes and provides Judge Nelson with evidence that she uses in her ruling against the entire National Football League. Ugh. How about that, Ziggy Wolf? Not a good year for the Vikes. I think that ties into their whole calendar year, 12 months of just disaster from the moment Brett Favre decided to throw across his body. In that New Orleans game, it was just all downhill. Somebody, I hope somebody's writing a book about it. That'd be a good book. It was an amazing year. I mean, they had so many things that went wrong from the time that their roof collapsed, uh, Brett Favre collapsed, and his streak ended, and the Randy Moss drama, and you know, chewing out the caterers, and the it, cell phone. It was, always some, it was always something with them. It was really a remarkable year. It, it would be the kind of book that I mean, people have a hard time selling because no one in Minnesota would want to relive that. And no. we've all been entertained and now bored by it by now. Yeah, it's true. That's a good point. Speaking of boring, uh, I'm so tired of hearing about this freaking lockout and oh, the court God. decisions and all this stuff. And it's your job. I don't blame you. I don't blame anybody who covers the league. It's your job to report news, and this is all news. But at some point, we just need to I, – I just wish the media could just say, you know what, we're just going to tell you when the season starts. I know you, you can't, know but you must be feeling that a little bit, right? I hate it. I hate it. You know, I, di I didn't do this job. I, I, there's a reason I didn't go to law school, and it's one of the only times in my life that I wish I did. And to me, I really try to push back and resist the story and not touch it only at key moments. Key yeah. moments. And to me, the key moments are – well, there, this one with Judge Nelson this week was a key moment because she brought the NFL – fairly close to reopening for business. And we're going to get a ruling here from her again in the next 24 hours or so. And then the Eighth Circuit, I, boy, I even need to go on like this. It bores me. But it was sometime in the next week or so, we're going to find out if and when free agency is going to begin. Right. And I care about that. That I care about. I care about when the off season where we could see moves begins, and I care about when we're going to see football again. Beyond that, I don't care that the owners follow the brief, that – 
the players poke the bomb, the, this, I mean, it, it, it pours me to, and people don't care. They just don't care. I guess the only salient point from these last few months is that it does seem like the courts are siding with the players. Can well, we say that? And I said this to Roger Goodell yesterday. The NFL lost the American Needle case. It lost the ruling on the Michael Vick bonus money case. It lost the ruling on the television lockout insurance money. And again, I don't like legal stuff, but that ruling from Judge David Doty was scathing and fascinating. And then yep. they lost this week to Judge Nelson. So clearly, something has not been going well for the NFL in all its legal strategies here because they've lost all these cases going forward. And the way that Judge Nelson wrote this brief, and I don't want to get bogged down in this, she wrote it in the opinion of many to be appeal proof. And the Eighth Circuit, the Court of Appeals, is said to be pro-business, pro-employer, conservative, traditional, Republican, all that. But she wrote this in such a way people believe that it's going to be difficult for the NFL to win an appeal. And if that's the case, then it would be a clean sweep. The NFL just getting swept all across the board and the players winning at every single turn. Yeah, and also, by the way, nobody feels bad for the owners because they can't figure out the best possible way to split up all the money they're making from this league. I think I'm sure the judges feel that way too, right? I think over the last decade, the value of franchises has tripled. And you know what's amazing? And this is true, Bill, that I will talk to the players and I'll say, boy, players are are positively right here. I mean, you know, the NFL, uh, I totally understand where the players are coming from. And then you can talk to the league, though, and you can say, wow, I I see where they're coming from. And the players are in the wrong. And I think, you know, people say, whose side are you on? I'm on the side of a deal. I'm pro deal. I I just want to see them get it done. I want to be done with this. I want to see football. But it's difficult when you talk to both sides to come away with a general feeling. I think most people believe that the owners have made money, they'll continue to make money, and they don't feel bad for them. And I totally get that and understand that and appreciate and respect it and agree with it. But I think both sides to have this go on as long as it has deserve some blame here because we're now six-plus weeks into this lockout. There's no signs of it ending anytime soon. People are just angry about it, and they, they just want their sport back. Just give it back to them. And you know what? People, I think it's starting to affect the popularity of the sport a little bit. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of a hit. Of course, if they get it settled soon, people come back. They love their fantasy football. They love the games. They love the Sundays. They love the gambling. They love the HDTV. They love all that. I get it all. But some of this is going to have to erode the foundation of support that the league has. It just has to. Yeah. Well, and also, the the league's done a lot of stuff to kind of test the patience of the fans and with a the lot. seat licenses I, I and I, making people pay for stadiums, et cetera, et cetera. And this seems like a tipping point for the league. And if they go away just because really, really rich billionaires want to make more money than they're already making, and then, uh, you know, the other part that drives me crazy is if you're not happy with owning a team, just sell it. There's 10 people that want to buy it. It's not like uh, you're going to be putting this thing on eBay and hoping you're going to be getting a minimum bid. Like Everybody wants to buy an NFL team, so you own something that, that actually has real value, so then don't tell us that it doesn't have value because it does. And not only does it have real value, but you're not going to lose money when you do sell it. Nobody yeah. will lose money when they sell their franchise. Yeah, so it sounds like things are heading toward it working out. Now, do you feel like the players, the players' union should have allowed these guys to show up at the draft? I was surprised that they're doing that. Well, I I was curious to see how this would work here in New York this week with the activities, because usually the players are turned over to the league, and the league has an itinerary that is unbelievable to keep up with. I mean, they're taking these players all around. They're taking them to inner-city schools to work with the kids. They're taking them down to Chelsea Piers to do press conferences. They're taking them on the morning news programs, Good Morning America and the Today Show and the early show. And they're just parading these guys all around to sponsorship events, to corporate events, to promotional appearances, and I don't know the level of cooperation that the league is going to get from the players today and tomorrow leading up to the draft. Now, I think it's going to create a different set of dynamics, and I think the league is smart enough tomorrow night not to have Roger Goodell trot out the way he normally does to say hello to the crowd. I think somehow it's just going to be a very subtle, quick little entrance from Roger, like from Beneath the podium, they're going to raise him up or something. <laughs> and he's going to get up there so they can avoid what is going to be a nasty reception. I mean, we've never had a draft, never, where free agency has followed the draft. That's yeah. never happened. 
And it's kind of, we talked to Mike Lombardi. He was saying it's really screwed teams up because usually they take free agency and they fill some of the holes of their team. And then with the whatever draft pick, you know, they have that. Now everybody has holes and and it seems like some teams are going to use their draft picks to fill the holes more than anything else. They have to. And, you know, the big question always is it comes back to the quarterbacks. And you've got quarterbacks that are going to be traded. They're going to sign as free agents. Donovan McNabb, Vince Young. Matthew Hasselback, Alex Smith. Uh, it, there's a long list of quarterbacks, Mark Bolger. And then you have teams that are going to go draft some of these guys. Cam Newton, who will go number one, it looks like. And yeah. Blaine Gabbert, and Jake Locker, and Ryan Mallett, and Andy Dalton, and Christian Ponder. And some of these teams aren't going to get a quarterback in the draft, and they're going to turn towards those other guys, like a Kevin Cobb, to see if they can go pry them loose at the appropriate point in time. But it's going to be a different set of dynamics for each of these teams to work through to see how much patience they have, to see how anxious they get, to see how panicked they become if and when they don't get a quarterback. Because if you don't have a quarterback in this league, you got no chance. Right. None. You know, you just I was most excited about the Pats having three of the top 33, but now I'm most yep. excited for the Roger Goodell entrance. You, you oh. totally swayed me. That's going to be unbelievable. I didn't even think about that. Oh, they're, they're, and I said to him yesterday, I said, you know, he's very savvy, very smart. What kind of reaction do you think you're going to get? And he he, he obviously spun it positive. Hey, the draft is great. Fans are going to be happy to be there. It's going to be a great night for everybody, great night for these young men. Yeah. And I said to him, have you ever been booed? And he laughed and he said, oh, you know, listen, I think fans will, you know, speak their mind tomorrow night. Or he, Bill, he is going to get ripped tomorrow night. He's going to be booed worse than any – NFL player or official has ever been booed in Radio City Music Hall, ever. Wow. It'd be funny if he dressed like... I'm just thinking back of the, the least popular Jets and Giants draft picks where the, where the Jet fans and the Giants yeah. have gone nuts. And I'm trying to think of the picks that they hated. I guarantee you tomorrow night Roger Goodell exceeds them on the decibel level of boos on the boo meter. You don't think he'll show up in a suit of armor, right? That'd be funny. Uh, maybe maybe disarm it a little bit. Show up dressed like RoboCop. Or... I, I think I think he'll be fine. They'll take the necessary steps that need to be done here. Yeah, and, and he'll show up there. But yeah, he he's not going to be greeted warmly by the fans here. And and uh, look, everybody. No, I was saying about. I was saying like as a joke, like he would be dressed up. You know, like he'd have, be having fun with it. You know what? I don't think anybody with the league has had fun with this lockout. Yeah, you're I think right. it's a good idea. But I don't, I don't, I don't see Roger Goodell playing to that tomorrow night. I just don't see it. Hey, let me ask you something. So you've obviously rubbed shoulders with uh, a couple commissioners, a couple yeah. rich billionaire owners, some people who <laughs> are in position of real power. And a lot of the times that you meet these people, they have a charisma to them and a command and a command of the room and you just get you're with them and you just get this feeling like I can kind of see why this guy's in charge when you spend time with Goodell like just this week when you did your long interview with him do you get that feeling from him yeah no I think he's a charismatic guy I've known him for a while I mean he started out the league as a PR intern where he was just pestering them to get in the door and they finally hired him in his words just to basically stop him have, uh, harassing them. For, I mean, literally, they, he was sending letters to Don Weiss, Pete Rozelle's assistant, for weeks at a time, begging for a job, and they finally let him in the door. And he is a very nice, thoughtful man. Does he have a temper? Does he have a sharp business side? Does he have that competitive side? Absolutely. You know, listen, you know, I've been to a lot of owners' meetings through the years, and I'm one of those guys that doesn't sleep a lot, Bill. Like, I'm up early all the time, and so yeah. I'll go down to the gym at 5 in the morning. I don't know that I've ever beat Roger Goodell into the Hotel Health Club ever, ever. Like, I'll walk in there at 5.03, and Roger's got this big sweat going on the treadmill. I'm, you got to be kidding me. Right. Well, I walk in there at, at – whatever time it is, he's on the machine. You know, I'm waiting for him to get done with the machine. He's on it. He's got a full sweat going. And, again, like I said, I'm in there early, really early. But I don't beat him. It's a, it, it's amazing. It kind of irks me there, Bill. i, I got to beat him one of these times. <laughs> But that's that's pretty good that he's up at five. I, I you always hear that with CEOs, and that's why we call my son the CEO because he's up at five every day. But it does seem like uh, the people in position of power they don't need sleep for some reason. How old is your son now? My son is now three and a half, and he'll now get up at about six fifteen, six thirty. So it's somehow that that is like fantastic for us. But and yeah. that's your only child. 
Now, we have two kids. We have a daughter and a son, and my son has single-handedly turned my hair white. It's turning white. Cause and how old is your daughter? Daughter is turning six, yeah. So, That's How about you? Yeah, I, I got uh, an 11-year-old boy, and we've got a two-and-a-half-year-old girl. And uh, all I can tell you is that, that that's the greatest. That is the best. Yeah. Well, what about what do you what do your kids think when you're thrown into this draft inferno for three weeks at a time? I mean, you, you know probably what? are just my gone, son right? doesn't care one bit about any of this. Could care less. Um, you know, it's funny. We'll be at home and and he'll be like, "Can you help me with this video game?" And I'm like, "Hey, hey dear, I'm talking to the head coach of the. I mean, hold on one sec. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't care. Doesn't care. And my daughter." She's funny, you know. She she knows that I work in Connecticut, and she'll always, you know, whenever you know, the first thing she says, she gets at ESPN, and she's funny. But she doesn't like to see she doesn't like to see me on TV because if I'm on TV, that means I'm not spending time with her. So that 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 pisses her off. Do you have one of those Blue Point cameras in the house? Uh, Glow Point, yeah. Glow Point, house. yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, you know, it it I feel uh, incredibly blessed to be able to do work from home and just a. Uh, it's, it's it's fantastic. Now sometimes we have issues with it, you know, and, and I'm technologically challenged. That's an understatement, a big yeah. understatement. So if anything goes wrong, I'm incredibly helpless and incredibly frustrated by everything. But uh, it's uh, yeah, they they set up my house. In fact, they gave me Peter Gammon's old camera. Oh, I, and I'm going to tell you something. To me, that was like uh, that, that's like a young aspiring musician. You know, being thrown the uh, you know sweatbands that right. Springsteen was wearing. I mean, it, I, I I was so honored to get Peter Gammon's Glowpoint camera in my house. Oh, yeah, I'm, oh, wow, that's 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 awesome. Well, when you know Buster only, he just wears a jacket and a shirt and a tie, and he wears no pants. He's naked from the waist down. You don't do that, right? Uh, you know what? <laughs> I will say this: uh, in the summer, I'll wear shorts. Yeah, you got in it. The, yeah, of course. In the winter, though, uh, I'll wear jeans usually. But, you know, it's funny. The, the challenges of having a glow point camera, I, we have a lot of dogs at our house, Bill. A lot. Oh, yeah. And and I've had dogs that have, like, I have one dog. One dog's very well behaved. She just lays in there the whole time, doesn't say anything. But I've had dogs charge in as I'm doing it, and I'm just waiting for them to bark because they're temperamental and angry. And, uh, and they could do anything at any point in time. And it's always a nervous moment when they walk in. And I've had my daughter walk in and just start talking. In fact, one time I was finishing up a hit on Sports Center, and, and my daughter walked in, Daddy, Dad. And, and I'm like, uh, thanks, Adam. You might want to get back to your daughter right now. So <laughs> now we've got to keep a lock on the door and bolt it down. And um, it's uh, So we'll be, seeing you, we'll be seeing you in uh, YouTube at some point with some sort of crazy dog glow point camera incident. You know what? I, I've, already had, I've already had documented uh, YouTube incidents, like one of my first – couple of months at ESPN, they had me on and, and somehow something got caught in my throat. I was on with Sage Steele and I had this coughing attack that they still play as a bump on the Howard Stern show all the time. Really? I have people, I have people come up to me, oh, we heard you coughing on the Howard Stern show. Yeah, I made a fool of myself. I embarrassed myself and Howard Stern loves to use it on a show. I don't listen to the show all that much, but I, I know whenever it's on because people will be sending me tweets about it or they'll send me, te- hey, you were just on the Stern show again, coughing, your brain's out. So, yeah, that happens. So what, uh, at what point in your career did you become, did, did sources start coming to you versus vice versa? That's a great question. You know what? Um, people will say to you, you know, how do you develop sources? And I think over time, and I mean this, I think what happens is you wind up helping people um, more than they help you. And I, I, one of the greatest parts of my job, I love being able to help teams flush out situations and figure out things and uh, um, uh, predicting the draft and going over mocks. And, you know, I, I never would compromise anybody. I never can compromise anybody. You can't do that. Like, you know, um, there'll be so, various scenarios where, you know, and I've thought about this, certain teams are asking about certain players and, a division rival will call you about a certain, you know, that, that guy. And I can't share that, you know, because it came, like, if it's the Ravens and the Steelers, I'm not telling the Ravens what the Steelers said or the Steelers or the Ravens. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, but if it's at a conference and there's not a not a uh, disadvantage for one team, i got no problem doing that. Um, and you get to the point where 
Um, you develop relationships with these people, and I, I think one of the great parts of my job, the thing that I'm most privileged to do, is you get to talk to the smartest people uh, in their respective fields. So you can talk to some really smart coaches. You can talk to some really smart front office general managers or presidents or whoever it may be. You can talk to some owners. You can talk to some – and you know what? If – if um, you don't want to, you, you don't have to, you don't have to deal with those people again. And it just, it's, 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 it's an unbelievable, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's, but if, uh, but if I'm a GM, let's say yeah. I'm, let's say I'm Bill Belichick and I'm friends with you and yeah. I have three picks and I have 17, 28, 33, and I want to take Ryan Mallett with 28 yeah. and I call you and we have a good relationship. And at some point I say to you, uh, what are you hearing about Ryan Mallett? And you say, yep. oh, man, he's really dropping. Teams are scared. He's immature, et cetera, et cetera. Then Bill Belichick says, yeah, we're a little worried about him too. But deep down he wants to take him. Wouldn't it be smart to play information guys like you because then hopefully you'll you know, write? You know, let me say this, Bill. Let me say this. I, I know where you get – I know where you're coming from. I've never I, – I, I can remember being played one time. and It was actually pretty funny. Um, and there's a story behind it, but I, I don't think that the people, I might be totally naive and ignorant. I just, I, I always am honest with people, just a hundred percent honest. I'm an open book. You know, here I am. This is what I'm about. This is what's going on. You know, if, if a team tells me they're thinking of a certain guy and, and they, they ask my opinion, I, uh, I don't know about that. Like the guy hearing positive things, not hearing positive things, whatever it may be. I never, you know, um, and I'm sure over time there have been people, you know, I, I'd rather people not tell me things. And I think that's the way that um, the people that I've dealt with have been by and large. I'm sure they've tried to snow me. But I remember one time back when I used to cover the Broncos in Denver, yeah. uh, it had to be roughly 2000, they wanted me to know uh, that they were interested in Todd Pinkston. Uh, somehow one of the coaches called me, played him up. And I wrote this whole story. The day, this was on the draft, is on Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. And I remember I had a charity event on Friday night that I had a, go to and, and I wrote the story all day about how they were going to go after Todd Pinkston, this wide receiver from Southern Mississippi. And I go to the event that night and I happen to see the Broncos owner Pat Bowen and I go up to him, I saddle up next to him and I say, hey, so uh, you know, we're talking about the drag. So tomorrow, huh? Todd Pinkston, huh? And he looks at me and he goes, Todd Pinkston? Oh, no. And I go, no? And he goes, no. And I go, oh no. Because I had already filed my newspaper story and that day, you know, in those days, which not that long ago, you know, you're following a newspaper story about nine nine thirty. You, you're going off to do what you got to do and you read about it in the next day's paper that's it it's fro it's there in ink so i was like oh my god so i ran to the phone and literally was on the phone all night up until deadline and i dictated a story over the phone that said that the broncos would be taking delta o'neill and the headline that never post the next day was broncos uh two broncos you know juan o'neill or whatever it was yeah and i remember the broncos organization being furious because they were planning to trade back behind the Kansas City Chiefs from like 15 to 18 to get an extra pick and still get O'Neal, and they felt like they couldn't do it once the story came out. And they thought they got me, but ultimately, you know, it was just a little game that we all had, and it was fun. Nice. But I don't, I, yeah, but I don't really believe that the people that I'm dealing with uh, are, are lying to me. It, you know, what, what I try to do with teams now, you know, you use Bill Belichick, right? So uh, Bill Belichick, you know, Bill, well, I'm on the phone with Bill Belichick, which I'm not. And and I'm not going to ask Bill Belichick or, or Coach A or Coach B or Coach C what his team is doing, because the teams around them know what they're doing. There are scouts that have an idea of what they're doing. There are agents that know what they're doing. I don't want to put anybody in a position where they're going to be compromised, and yeah. so I won't ask them that. And you know what? What happens is on draft day, a lot of times in the time leading up to the draft, some of the teams will tell me or they'll text me the pick before. But I don't want to ever put anybody in a position where they're compromised and tell me something that's going to compromise the player that they want in advance. I, I figure I can get some of that information anyway. What do I need to bother them that and put them in a bad spot? Does that make so any when, sense? But, so when you're working the phones, what are you trying to get? Okay, so if I have Rex Ryan on the phone, I want to know from Rex Ryan everything that he thinks Miami, Buffalo, and New England are doing. I want to know what he thinks the two, three, four, five teams in front of him are doing. I want to know what he thinks the teams right behind him are doing. I want to know what teams are calling him to trade up. I want to know what players he's taken off his board. I want to know what teams have medical cons- what players have medical concerns. I want to know what players have interested him. I want to know some of the interesting things he's learned. Make sense? Uh, yeah, totally, hundred you know, percent. I mean, I, what, what, I'm not going to say. So, who are you taking? Who's the you know? And and I could ask, and I have done this. 
teams in the back half of the draft, 16 to 30. Hey, who's the top couple of guys on your board, period? Because they're not going to make it to them anyway. Right. So what does it matter if Team 18, the San Diego Chargers, says Marcel Darius is the top player on our board? doesn't matter, right? Yeah. No, I, I but mean... Now, but now, you know, I figure, okay, but now I know some of the guys that these teams like and who they really value and who are some great players at the top of the draft. And then, if you're speaking to a team at the top of the draft, you know, you could say to them, hey, boy... You know, five of the six teams that I spoke to, they, they believe that Darius is the best player here. And they appreciate you telling that. And maybe they'll sing in the pick on Dredd. Who knows? You know, you're just bartering information. That's all it is. Something and if I'm Rex Ryan, I like talking to you because I'm telling you what I think the other teams in my division are going to do. And as I'm telling you this, you might say, oh, no. Actually, I'm not hearing that. I'm I'm actually hearing Miami is starting to think about a QB. And then he's like, oh, that's it. But so it's almost like you're, you're two buddies in a weird way. Well, and the other thing is I'm not doing a mock draft. So I, you know what? I don't care who you're picking. I'm yeah. going to try to find out who you're picking without your help. Yeah. I'm not worried about it. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know uh, who, who nails a mock draft? Does anybody Nobody. Really, like, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're doing real well, you're getting seven, eight, nine picks. That's right. exceptional, Right. So why would I engage in a guessing game anyway? It's absurd. You know, mock drafts are incredibly interesting. They're fun. They give you some insight as to where players are going to go. But ultimately, they're not real meaningful. You know, but they are. But they are very interesting. Don't get me well, wrong. I, I got to say, I, 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 I look at them all. If you check in, like for instance, I didn't really even read anything about this draft until this week because I was just I'm so bummed out by the lockout and all this yeah. stuff. Normally, I would have been. A diet, you know, breathing in every possible everything because the Patriots have so many picks. But I jumped into it this week, and I couldn't believe Cam Newton was the number one pick on most of these yeah. boards. So, you know, I guess some of this stuff is incremental, but when you kind of take a step back and think, well, look where we were in January and look where we are now, the fact that he rose that high is kind of, that, that to me was the number one incredible thing that I noticed. Well, what's fascinating to me is in talking to so many people, there are people, teams I've spoken to that say Cam Newton, Grand Slam, great pick, going to be a terrific player. And I've had teams tell me, wouldn't touch the guy. Wouldn't touch him. Wow. And it just seems they're split. Like, people really like Patrick Peterson. They really like Von Miller. They really like Marcel Darius. They really have questions about Cam Newton. And I got a text this morning, FYI, Jerry Richardson, the Panthers owner, this is what the text said, loves Cam Newton. Mm. And I was like, whoa. That seals the deal. I mean, done. Yeah. Barring anything unforeseen, Cam Newton's going number one. And maybe at some point with these quarterbacks, we just got to realize it's with everyone, no matter how much of a slam dunk it seems like they are or how much potential, whatever, it's, you're playing the odds. It's like a poker hand. You oh, know, let me Cam Newton's so 65% chance maybe he's, he's a star, and there's 35% chance he bombs. Well, the amazing part is, if you, I mean, it's, it's very simple, but it's very true. If you look at the draft, basically every team in the top half of the draft, from 1 through 16, with the exception of Dallas, which had an injury quarterback, or Houston, that struggled on the stretch. But, but the majority of the teams, from 1 to 16, have a quarterback question, a big quarterback question. Yeah. And the teams from 17 through 32 have their back of the future pretty much. And that's what this league is. You get a quarterback, you got a chance. You don't have a quarterback, you don't have a chance. And that's why Carolina ultimately will probably roll the dice on Cam Newton because they believe he's going to give them a chance in a division where they would have to go against Matt Ryan of the Atlanta Falcons and Drew Brees and the Orleans Saints and Josh Freeman of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They have to have a quarterback. And clearly they're not convinced right now that Jimmy Clausen is going to be that guy. So it looks like all indications, all signs point that way, that they're going to go and roll the dice on Cam Newton. And it may work out for him, and it may blow up. But that's the case with any one of these picks. I know I'm not convinced on Jimmy Clausen. Uh, but, yeah, you look at this draft and you think, Von Miller and Patrick Peterson, those guys, I can lock those guys in. Those guys are going to have really good careers. Agreed. And, but it's funny that the draft doesn't work that way. They end up... Patrick Peterson might go seventh, but he's a mortal lock to be a really good quarterback. You know, but you, you just don't know. I mean, Aaron Rodgers kept sliding and went, yeah. what, 24-25, yeah. 
And if you could do that draft over right now, he'd be the number one pick in the draft. Yeah. So a team is going to be looking at that decision tomorrow where, you know, maybe Blaine Gabbert sliding to four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve. Who's pulling the trigger on him? And maybe he's a great quarterback, and maybe he's not. Maybe Blaine Gabbert goes bust. But again, it comes back to the quarterbacks, and that's why there's so much interest in all these quarterbacks and where they'll all wind up. And particularly with the fact that nobody's been able to trade for Kevin Cobb or Donovan McNabb or Vince Young or sign Mark Bulger or Matthew Hasselbeck or whatever quarterback is out there because, again, that, that's going to define these teams going forward. That's the deal. Who's your favorite quarterback in this draft? I think if I'm going to pick one quarterback in this draft, the one, the one quarterback I continue to hear really good things about, and again, I, I want to make this very clear, I don't sit down and study the guys, X's yep. and O's wise. And, I, and I, I, I tell people, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I like to listen to people who do know what they're talking about. I've heard a lot of good things about Christian Ponder. Now, really? again, yeah. I'm not telling you he's the guy, but I'm just saying that there are a lot of people that, that feel pretty good about Christian Ponder and the pro quarterback that he might become one day. I've heard, you know, we were talking about Ryan Mallett. I've had people tell me that Ryan Mallett, for all the questions that there are about him, and as far as he may or may not fall, I've had people tell me he's the best quarterback in this class, bar none, the best. Most ready, best arm, ready to play. Well, you know, the one factor that we just don't know until the draft happens is it's it actually is kind of good if the guy got picked. 12 picks later than he thought or one round later than he thought because now all of a sudden he's got this built-in motivating factor. And I think well, with Rodgers, yeah. that really helped him. Yeah, not only that, but I think you know, on the one hand, you, the pressure's off you. You know, the expectations are, the quarterback goes in the first round, fans want that guy. Let's just say tomorrow um, the Jacksonville Jaguars take Andy Dalton at 16. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical. They're not, you know, yeah. I think they're doing no. But people are going to be screaming for Andy Dalton next year the moment David Garrard struggles. And it's going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on that team and those quarterbacks for Andy Dalton to play sooner than he should. And that's going to be a difficult situation for anybody. If you get pushed back in the draft, there's not as much attention on you. There's not as much pressure on you. And that is a little bit what happened with Aaron Rodgers with him sliding. And you you, you think back to those kinds of things. Then the flip side, uh, of course, is that teams could be quicker to go in another direction. Like Jimmy Clausen does go in the second round. If Carolina got him in the first round, Last year, do you think they'd be going Cam Newton this year? Right. I, I bet not. That's a good point. And you know, the other thing is like Blaine Gabbert. If, if Arizona takes him at five, mm-hmm. I would argue that's not the greatest thing. That could, that's not the greatest scenario for Blaine Gabbert. Now he's the savior. Oh, we picked you fifth. You have to be good right away. And it plays into what you talked about earlier. Whereas if he slid to, I don't know, twenty-two, all of a well, sudden. You know, let me say this. Blaine, the quarterback, you know, Blaine Gabbert, I mean, you could just pick the team. Washington at 10, Minnesota at 12, Miami at 15, Jacksonville at 16. He goes any of those places. Don't you think whether it's 5 or 16 or even a team that trades up into the back half of the first round, Cincinnati, Buffalo, Tennessee makes a move and trades up for Atlanta's pick. Yeah. Don't you think when that happens that – I mean, let's just say it's Buffalo that did it. Buffalo takes Marcel Darius at number three, and then they trade up and get uh, Christian Ponder at 28. I can tell you this. I can tell you what they're talking about in Buffalo next week. They're not talking about Marcel Darius. They're right. talking about Christian Ponder. Yeah, that's true. Quarterbacks. Well, Adam Schefter, go out there and do your thing. Radio, this is like a big smorgasbord for you. Uh, this is, uh, And this may be the last piece for a while, right? Yeah, what are you going to do? You're, maybe you start covering, like, soccer? MLS. You know what? I, I, you know, I remember back when I was uh, in uh, graduate school in Chicago, and I was working for the Chicago Tribune on the weekends. I used to cover fencing and curling. Yeah, fencing. And one could time be I went out to a curling match, and I remember one time I get out there, and I'm watching this match, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on because I've never been to a curling match in my life, and I'm watching for 35, 40 minutes to see if I get a grasp on it. And finally, I walk over to somebody and I said, "When does this begin?" And they said, "It's over." I said, "It's over." <laughs> What? Who won? They said that guy over there. Let me go interview that guy and go write up a story. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. Maybe we could send you to do some college volleyball. Hey, maybe, maybe, gymnastics. Yeah, maybe, maybe I get invited back for my second BS report. Yeah, well, we're gonna have to check in now. I'm fascinated to know what happens to you if this drags on for another few months. <laughs> Adam Schefter, we will see you on ESPN. We will see you on ESPN.com, and uh, we will see you down the road in the BS report. Thanks for the time. Hey, Bill, I really appreciate having me today. Thanks very much. Enjoy the draft tomorrow and Friday. Thank you, you too. 
target to set off. Whoa! Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.